my guest this evening, this has been a dream of mine to have Ken Dowling here. I'm a huge fan and I've never known anyone who can translate trends and make them make sense for women in the way that Ken can. It's absolutely extraordinary. Last night we saw an Emma Marcus show. It was wonderful. He puts clothes together and the way he breaks down the trends and, and puts it all in order is just quite unique. But beyond that, Ken and I have had um, a series of conversations over time where we've discussed some of the issues surrounding um, not just Australian designers, but designers coming from faraway places like Australia and what international buyers are really looking for and what he sees the challenges as being. He's an incredibly experienced man, he's a senior vice president of Union Marcus and obviously it's part of the fashion director of the wonderful department store. But on top of that, he's a force. He's on the Vogue Fashion Fund. <laughs> he'll, he'll leave us to go to judge the Vogue Fashion Fund for the CFDA. <laughs> and he's, it, we're just lucky to have him here. So please welcome him and thank you very much for joining us. Because I don't know if I see myself as being a force, but my mother will be thrilled. How are you all this evening? Good. Nice of you all to be here. So look, I thought we'd start at the beginning. Let's just give everyone a little rundown in terms of your career and how you arrived here. Because you've basically done everything, haven't you? I have done everything. <laughs> I built the Ark, I got the animals on it too. <laughs> you know what? I actually, I'm from Seattle, which is the most random, faraway place in the entire universe of fashion in the United States. And I, can I tell a little story how yes. I actually somewhat got started? I was actually just in Los Angeles, this little FYI, the week prior to coming to Sydney. And by the way, you live in the most glorious city in the entire world. I have the biggest love affair with the city. If I could have a love affair, I might move here. But unfortunately, <laughs> I've got a job to do. Um, but I digress. I was just in Los Angeles with Dion von Furstenberg. Um, for part of the CFDA Book Fashion Fund. And I had to leave Los Angeles to go back to Dallas, where our headquarters are, to host a party with Dion. But <clears throat> I have a very special relationship with her. When I was eight years old, my mother brought me to a department store in Seattle to meet Dion von Furstenberg when she was launching her wrap dress. I was mortified to meet this woman who is such a celebrity, but I was so mesmerized with the idea of coming near fashion royalty. And my mother pushed me up to the desk. And my mother was a very glamorous person in my life, and still is, actually. But here is Dion von Furstenberg with the hair and the frosty makeup <laughs> and the legs and the wrap dress and the accent. She seduced me from the hello. And she said, darling, darling, what can I do for you? I, said, I want to work in fashion. Darling, you will, you will, you will. <laughs> And I have to tell you, her kind words to an eight-year-old boy propelled me to the, to the job I have today. When you were eight years old in Seattle, you did not tell people you wanted to work in fashion. <laughs> you know, today the idea of fashion is such an open conversation, and you can be anything you want to be, and you can say you want to be in fashion, and people don't look at you cross-eyed and want to throw rocks at you. When you were eight years old in Seattle, it was an entirely different story. It took me years to tell Dion, I met you when I was eight years old. Trust me, when you're a woman, you do not want to hear from a man of my age. She, she was mad when she was eight years old. <laughs> but I'm so fortunate that today she is a friend. And it was that kind of encouragement that really continued my quest to want to work in this industry. And I have, I have done a little bit of everything. I worked in a visual department where I dressed mannequins, where I didn't even know how mannequins came apart. I was a model when I was 17 years old, so the time I was 21, which was the worst career of my life. I remember going to New York and we got locked into a hallway with a mirror women where they played Shaka Khan. <laughs> you don't even know who Shaka Khan is? If not, Google her. Um, <clears throat> is this not working? Did you miss all of that? <laughs> I hate to repeat myself. Where they played Shaka Khan, feel for you over and over and over until we learned how to walk. I have styled, I have done hair, I have done makeup. 
I have drafted patterns, I've picked up pins on design room floors, I've designed clothes, I have done a little bit of everything. And, and I encourage you, there's nothing you should not do, because the more you know, the more powerful you become in the industry. And, and I love what I do today, because as the fashion director for Nina Marcus, I get to spend so much time with people who love fashion as much as I do, and I get to spend time with women, and I love women. I love being with women who love clothes, and that is one of the most satisfying things about my entire career, is spending time with the women who love, who love the same things that I love. Oh, sorry. I'm not good at shooting. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that, that's one of the things that I feel is very special about tonight, is that I know that there are people in this room who are gonna change their whole outlook on fashion and their future career because they've met Ken. And that is very, very, very special. So, I guess, look, when it comes to being an Australian designer, obviously you have mentored many designers through the CFTA and um, both Fashion Planning Plan program. What do you see as the key challenges in terms of, of breaking through? Well, you know, it's interesting because not only the talents I meet through CFDA Vogue Fashion from the Council of Fashion Designers of America, but I'm, I am mentoring young talent daily because there's always someone who wants to have a brand and, and wants to be the next big thing. And, and the first thing I say, and I will say this to all of you, if you're in this industry because you want to be famous, you're in it for the wrong reason. In fact, you should probably just get up and go because it's not about being famous. If you're looking to be famous, you'll never be famous. Fame will find you and fame finds talent. And, and I think that's a very important message that you all need to understand. And, and I think something else that's most important in our industry today, you have to know your customer. You have to know the man, the woman, the girl. Who are you dressing? And I spend an enormous amount of my time in and amongst the people who I'm dressing. And I will tell all of you, it's so easy to dress a 19-year-old starlet and put her on a red carpet or put her in front of a premiere because it's hard to make a 19-year-old look bad. And if you look bad at 19, you gotta give it up because they're <laughs> very The talent comes in taking a woman who's not confident in her body, who doesn't love every inch of herself, and make clothes for her that when she walks into a retail establishment, she is compelled to turn her handbag upside down and dump all of her money on the floor and cry and weep because it's the most amazing thing she's ever seen. And it's not always an easy task because if you don't know what a woman wants, you can't do that. You also have to give a woman what she doesn't know that she wants yet, and the same with a man. You know, I, I think one of the biggest challenges that confronts most young talent from a business point of view is the actual understanding of the business. You don't have to ultimately run your business. You need to find someone to run your businesses, but you need to understand the business of fashion. And what I find most curious with any young designer is that they do not understand the importance and the power of pre-collections. Now, in the United States, we have varied levels of price banding of businesses, what we call contemporary as kind of fast fashion, Helmut Lang, Rag and Bone, Alexander Wang, Philip Lynn, brands like that, or then there's big runway collections. Not that some of those people don't have big runways. But if you're going to be a designer at a designer level with a runway, you need a pre-collection. Because without a pre-collection, you do not have a business. 80 plus percent of a buyer's open to buy goes into a resort collection or a pre-fall collection. You won't want to do runway because you think it's glamorous, you want to dress models, you want to see it trot up and down the catwalk, so do I, it's my dream, it's how I live. <laughs> but you cannot make a living, you cannot build a brand, and you cannot have the fortunes that you should want if you cannot build a business model of understanding that where people come to buy is in those pre-collections. And they don't have to be dumb pre-collections, they have to be full of great design. But 
80% of what you see in a store comes from a pre-collection. 20% is what we spend on runway. And of that 20%, God willing, it actually gets produced and shows up on time. All those things you see in her magazine, all those things on the cover, all those superlative things that say, call for a price, most of it never gets made. So I go to showrooms and I say, oh, just make a million dollar order. It's not gonna matter, we're gonna cancel half of it anyway, because it's not gonna even make its time period. Part of my job, sitting front row, is actually not only curating the trends as they're coming past to give my buyers direction, I'm also selecting ad looks at that time. There was a moment when I would select one or two ad looks. I now have to select three to five because it's very possible that what I'm loving and my taste level, I'm always picking something that's never going to be produced because it's made out of masticated paper put together with rubber bands and beaded in heaven. So, runway is great while you're trying to create a brand and an image for yourself, but to have money to buy homes and yachts and great art and travel the world, you're gonna have a great collection. It's just the reality of the business. Hopefully we don't have to share anyone. Don't! Um, I think this is where it's quite a unique opportunity for Australian designers because obviously always we've been in the Southern Hemisphere, it's been very challenging because locally we were trying to produce a spring-summer collection at the same time as you needed to produce producing an autumn-winter one internationally. However, now because of the growing importance even of pre-collections, it is possible that your spring-summer collection is the pre-collection for the Northern Hemisphere. Absolutely. You know, the most amazing thing that's happened in fashion is the internet because everybody wants a global business. You should want a global business. It's great when a boutique comes in and wants to buy your clothes, and we have a small business happening, but what the global market has created is the understanding that there are customers that are in need of clothes beyond the traditional idea of what is fall. And when I go see a pre-fall collection and it's boiled wool and it's bonded this and it's laden with fur, I just, I lose my mind. Do you know how many women are interested in wearing a bonded fabric? Zero. <laughs> Sculpts, it's more interesting, I feel more creative when I work with it. Good for you, go with God. <laughs> Truly go with God. There is not a woman who wants to wear a bonded fabric. Now it makes a great page for editorial, but it doesn't sell. I've had, I am sometimes seduced by a designer who tells me, but you have to buy this piece. And so we buy it, and it ends up on the markdown rod, and I shake my head and I think to myself, Ken, you're so much smarter than that. Why did you pick that thing up? Because it is such a global market, not only here in Australia, but in South America, in the warms of the United States, the need for transitional weight fabrics and transitional color palettes is paramount. The majority of my business is in warm weather climates internationally. Do I do business in Russia? Of course I do. But they have heat. It's 2014 getting into the year 2015. These are not people standing in line looking for toilet paper. These are wealthy people. So you have to understand that the climate change allows you to design clothes that are literally a transitional type of fashion point of view. It needs to have the feel and the emotion of fall, but it doesn't have to weigh 800 pounds. And also remember, women of wealth have cars. They're not out on the sidewalk hailing a bus trying to, you know, put their 25 pence in getting somewhere. They don't need a big old boiled wool coat. They wear coats because they need something to arrive in and leave at the coat check, not because they're cold. But that's what you learn when you go meet the customers around the world. How she lives and her lifestyle should dictate how you're thinking about designing a collection and the woman you're designing for. So tell me something, in terms of the, so with the CFDS showroom, so Americans from Paris, which we always go and see, what would be your recommendation were the, um, were the fashion chamber to set up Australians in Paris, in terms of what people should really have on that rack? If you've got one shot at impressing a designer like you, and you have a, sm a small rack, and you're one of many designers in that showroom, what, what are you looking well, let me ask you a question. Are you thinking of doing something like that? We would love I, to do I, something I actually, like that. 
can I tell you, I, I think it would be brilliant for the collective force of talent here in Australia to come together in one showroom space. You know, the challenge you all have is you're in the most gorgeous part of the world, but it is on the other side of the world. And so getting buyers to want to travel an entire day to get here is all but impossible. You have to go to the mountain. You're not going to bring them here necessarily. And to have that collective force, be it in Paris or in London, would be a brilliant thing. I, I will tell you what I look for. I look for flattering silhouettes. I look for clothes that the price is commiserate with the design and with the quality. And I'm a big stickler for quality because I often go to emerging talent and I see shoddy little samples and I'm being promised, oh, but the production will be better. Oh, my sewer stood over her finger and I should have wiped away the blood. <laughs> I have heard every, it's, it's like when you're a school teacher, oh, my dog ate my homework. <laughs> you know what, and start all over again. Because when you put your best foot forward, then I am most impressed. Clothes need to be steamed. Clothes need to be sewn appropriately. Clothes need to be finished appropriately and appropriate to the price that you're asking for them. I think it's fine to have a few of those crazy over-the-top things that show your creative spirit, but there also needs to be clothes that translate the dream of the runway into the reality of how a woman dresses. And, and that sounds simpler than it really is because it's the dream that brings us all to fashion it's the dream and the mystique of fashion that brings the customer to all of us, but there has to be a reality in how those clothes translate into her wardrobe. Because she's not buying them to hang them on the wall and make them art, she is buying them because she's actually wearing them. And back to the 19-year-old celebrity, she'll look adorable, but when you see an anonymous woman who you've never met walking down the street in something you've created, the chills that will run up and down your spine will be like no other. That is true success. I do think that that is an issue that we have in Australia, perhaps a, a misunderstanding between the difference between the ready-to-wear collections we see in Paris and frankly end up on the pages of Vogue and the more commercial collections. When you see ready-to-wear, for example, in a showroom in Paris, how do you like it? How do you like to see it range? Do you like the ready-to-wear interspersed with commercial or do you like there to be a clear definition? Is it? Well, it's, it's interesting because, <clears throat> and I become kind of my, my own dichotomy of a conversation. Usually when you go into a showroom, you see the runway collection by exit many times with the model's card ha hanging there. Um, because if I forgot Carly Kloss was wearing it, I'm glad to be reminded. Um, <laughs> though I actually remember these things. And, and then they take you through the commercial collection. One, understand, many of the things that are in your magazine and on your pages, I buy because my customers come to Neiman Marcus stores in the United States and online internationally because she wants those crazy over-the-top things. I'll give you an example. This spring season, there was a feather coat that topped feather hot pants at Valentino. I'm surprised you didn't see me like falling into the runway when it walked past because it made my heart stop. I bought the coat and the hot pants and it's my ad look and I'll have it in my stores. Did I buy 20 feather coats and 20 hot pants? Of course not, because when it's that amazing, you don't need 20 of them. But it doesn't mean that you're not gonna probably photograph that feather coat and feather hot pants because it's perfectly quality editorial. I buy that, but the bulk of my buy will not be in those over the top pieces because one, price prohibitive, and two, when one, three women find out that coat's out there, holy no, she doesn't want to show up and see that woman in another coat somewhere else. So you're very careful about how many you buy and you're thinking about a customer when you're buying it. So we often see runway in its pagination of the show and then we see the commercial pieces from that. And many times, as I said, you can go into some shows, 70% of a show you see on the runway doesn't even get produced, which is crazy when you think about it, and you're the generation of selfies and Instagram and Twitter. We're all sitting there taking pictures, oh, shooting it up faster than time. All these images that are flying around the world are of clothes that never see the light of day because they never get made. It's just insane to me. 
I try to make sure as many of those quotes as possible see the light of day and get on a woman's back because it's not what it's all about, right? So I guess one of my um, one of the other things I'd love people here to understand is when you do go on show, say in New York or in Paris, and perhaps you don't get as much attention as you would like, especially from me personally. No, not me. Okay. I just like get a lot from of Australia. Attention. You get a lot of attention no matter where you go. I just like for the sake of fun, having seen Ken obviously at the shows, and let me tell you, he is the hardest working man in fashion. He was there, front row. At every, it is extraordinary. I saw 115 shows in New York City alone. <laughs> and how so, many would that be in a season? Just to give everyone your picture. Oh, I see probably close to 500 shows, shows and presentations a season. Hence why maybe the Australians should all be together. Yes. <laughs> so you could become one of many to fit Well, in. actually, location is very important if you do something like that. It, it sounds ridiculous, but in Paris this season, there are all these roads that are closed, as you know, because they're doing all this construction. Paris is challenging anyway. It took an hour to get from the center of Paris into the Marais, where a lot of people have showrooms. Who has an hour to waste just in transport? So make it convenient so the retailers of small boutiques and, and, and big retailers can find you. You know, it's great to be in some obscure location or, you know, showing in the sewers and it makes you feel super cool. But you know what? Show where people can find you and get to you and look at a fashion calendar and say, oh my, this is happening in this location. We should do it here because we'll get the overflow of people leaving a show or they'll be close to another show. It actually works to your way. Because that's the thing, isn't it? We're going from shows to Reese's to shows, and quite often the Reese will have to be moved, or which is the initial one. So is that how you work? Do you do a Reese during the shows, and then does your buying team go back actually after the seasons finish? Actually, it's a very good buy? question because I, I, I would assume most of you think that buyers are sitting at the shows with me, and they are not. Um, because New York usually starts like this last season; it started September second, and the buyers didn't show up until the sixth or seventh, so I've been doing shows for five days. So I do daily trend flashes and I cover, re, do a, I cover each show with a quick little paragraph or two in images of my favorite looks from the runway. Um, it's kind of my version of Women's Wear Daily, but I'm a little bit more honest, because if it's good, it's good, if it's not, it's not, and I don't need clothes that aren't good. So I really let my buyers know what we're seeing, the trends that are continuous and things within a collection I love. I actually have no time to do reseason in New York, so I see 115 shows in New York. I then go to London, where I do London market, I receive most of London, then to Milan, where we see Milan, and I receive all of Milan in Milan, and then go to Paris, and then we see all of New York because all the New York collections bring their collections to Paris. So I re see Paris, New York, and what's left of London in Paris. We stay in Paris a week and a half after shows are over. And, and everyone's like, why do you re see? Because you don't truly know if it's made out of masticated paper and put together with rubber bands. You don't know if it weighs 800 pounds. You don't know if it's $3,000 or $333,000. So you have to go back and lift and touch and, and figure out what it all is. It can be really simple, isn't it? Sometimes I've, I've sworn that something's a dress and it could be a top and a skirt. And you have oh, no you, have, you have no idea sometimes. And I'm actually pretty smart. And so I have a pretty good idea of what something is. And then you're like, what if? So you just you start all over again. Or you find out your ad luck isn't even going to be made. So that's when we go back to Reese. And I actually, I'm always asking, what are the editors loving? What did Vogue pick? What is Bazaar loving? What are the girls liking it in style? I'm generally in tune with what they're picking for at looks. So I'm like, where's my look? Oh, Vogue already picked it up and they're shooting it in Paris. So it gives you a pretty good indication if your sense of what's happening in that collection is going in the right direction. Now, I'd love to talk to you about your involvement in the CFDA. So could you start with how you became involved to begin with? Because obviously we've just celebrated 10 years of the Vogue Fashion Fund. Well, it's actually quite a, quite a funny little joke around Neiman Marcus. Um, my boss often has to remind Anna Wintour that I work for him and not for her. Um, but Anna thinks I work for her, which is perfectly fine. Um, I was really brought into the fund through Anna, 
and, and the team at Vogue, because I spend as much time with them, and I'm not just saying that because you're sitting here, you know that. Um, so, it's an interesting process. We have over 100 candidates that bring in their portfolios every year to be reviewed, and from the 100, we call it down to about 40, 50, and then from there, the 10 judges, we each take five portfolios, and we scrutinize them from creativity, from their business acumen, from the size of their business, their direction where they believe they're going to take the business, and we select 10 candidates that we put through a very rigorous process. They have to, what I say, sing and dance in front of all of us and tell us their story and tell us about their business, where their business is going to go. There are design challenges. We have a fashion show in Los Angeles. And, and through the entire process, we are learning about them as individuals. We're learning about their business. And we're learning about what the potential of their business is beyond where they are today. And actually, when I, when I leave Melbourne, Sunday to arrive in New York on Sunday. We're doing our final judging of the 10, bringing it down to three winners that will be announced at a dinner party at Taiyabat that night. The craziest thing the last couple of years, we are filmed at every moment and it's now a television show. So, I know. If it's not already hair-raising enough for these poor young talents to be in front of myself, Anna Wintour, and Dion von Furstenberg, and Reid Krakow, there are television cameras everywhere following our every move. So, um, it, but it's fun. I don't mind the TV cameras, it's actually a good time. My customers think it's my TV show with Anna Wintour on it. It's your TV show. And I, and I told them, I said, I have to tell you, my customers love my show that you're on. And, and we got a big old laugh out of all that. So it is your show, I'm like, no, no, it's your show. But um, it, it follows us through the entire process of watching these designers. And, and it, it's, it's not a beauty pageant, but I will liken it because it is how they interact with one another, how they interact with us. So there's a little bit of congeniality that's part of it, how they present themselves, how they speak, their, their comfort level in talking about their brand and talking about what they design and, and who their customer is. You know, it's interesting when you talk to a young designer, they have no idea who they're dressing. So it, it, all, all of that plays into it. And you do ask tough questions, don't you? Because... Well, we have to get it right. You know, what's interesting about it, you know, when you look at people who have gone through the Fashion Fund, Jack and Laz at Proenza Schooler, Alexander Wang, Philip Lim, Joseph Altazara, I mean, all of these talents who are names that now are very important in American fashion have been through the fund. And not only do they win a cash award, they also receive mentoring. And so we're very careful to make sure that we're pairing a great mentor to them that is versed in whatever their particular craft is. If it's one of the shoe designers, a handbag designer, a jewelry designer, or a ready-to-wear designer, we're looking for a mentorship that works with them for a year to help guide them and begin to develop a business model to set them on the road to success. And do you get feedback from those mentors? As we, those do. we do, we do, absolutely. You know, it's interesting. I actually hear from the many individuals that go through the challenge far beyond after they've left, and I hear from their mentors all the time. Uh, as much as the talent believes when they win, the money is going to change their life, and it's, for many of them, it's a huge influx of cash to their business, because it's over $300,000 grand prize winning, in fact, it's about $350,000, which for a small business, as you all know, can you imagine what you could do with $350,000? The money's a great addition to what they're doing. The mentorship, at the end of the day, becomes one of the most valuable pieces of the program because they have an industry insider guiding them and sharing with them their tenured knowledge of their specific field. Now, I'd like to just talk about some fun things. This hasn't been fun yet. <laughs> but can you tell us, I mean, you've been seeing shows for a long time. Can you tell us some of the most sort of I guess memorable we've seen. Some of the crazy well, moments. I, I, have seen, I, have seen, I have seen every show in the entire world, and some that I probably didn't even need to see. I, I, I will tell you, I've had 
crazy moments from the time a fur protester, a Valentino, came flying over me naked, and the security people tackled her at my feet and sat on top of her as I was continuing to watch the show. I, I, I was so like taken back. There was a picture of me in Women's Wear Daily, I was like, and not because she was naked, I've seen many naked women in my day, it's what I do for a living, but I've never had a naked body come flying over my shoulder and land at my feet. I wasn't even sure where she had come from. So I, I literally had to recompose myself and remember, you are here to do business and you are here to find an ad looking for tethers on a naked woman laying on your boots. <laughs> you know, there, there, there are moments in fashion that that you just don't forget. And, and, and some of them, when I think about Alexander McQueen shows when Lee was alive and with us and blessed his soul, the, the, the height of the dramatic and the, the insane and the over the top. And, and I think about shows that were just beautiful that didn't need all the theatrics because the clothes said everything. And I, I love those moments that with the clothes say a lot, but I also like those highly dramatic moments as well. I, actually, I have another Valentino story. I, I had the great joy of being at the Valentino Au revoir when we were all flown to Rome, and there were dancers on the guide wires, and we were all sitting in the uh, <clears throat> Temple of Diana, and there was Carolina Herrera in a ball gown sitting on a stump of marble, smoking a cigarette. It was like something out of the 1950s. It was simply remarkable. And you know, when I look back, I'm so fortunate because I, I never thought I would find myself in those situations, but when I do, I, I, I love it. It's a very small portion of what we do for a living. <laughs> it's a portion we really love. Really, really hard. And, and I, I say that because we all love the glamour of what fashion brings, but the glamour is such a tiny little reward to all the hard work that it takes to develop a thriving business, to make clothes sell, and to keep customers happy. I mean, even in your life, just to give the students here in particular an idea, what portion of it really do you, do you see as being sort of the high glamour, and then how much of it? Oh, it's so How many interviews did you do today? What's that? How many interviews did you do today? Well, I started talking at 9 o'clock this morning. I stopped at 3.30 and I'm still talking. Um, you know, it, I travel continually. I travel 364 days a year, I swear. I, I, I live on an airplane. It's not that it's glamorous or not glamorous. I receive so much joy from working in an industry I love. And that's why you're all here. Can you imagine getting up and going to a job you absolutely detest? I just can't even imagine. I mean, I just can't even imagine. I get to work around the most gorgeous clothes in the world, the most beautiful models who are more hysterical than they're even beautiful. You have, I just did an ad campaign with Carly Kloss for two days in New York. The girl in heels is taller than I am and I was not happy about it. <laughs> I am 6'3 and will not be over tall. But, um, you know, th those things are great, but it's work at the end of the day. And, and I, I, I have to say, and I say it all the time, I do this because I always am remembering the women. And my mother said to me, when you're going to go into fashion, it is not about you. It is about you making women feel confident, making them feel beautiful, and finding things that celebrate them being women. And, and that's what's very important to me. So though it's work, I hope that we bring a little joy to women who want a little something, something in their lives besides just the everyday. And, and that's why I do it. You know, my, and, and I will quote my mother on this. <laughs> Pretty always trumps peculiar. No woman want, wants to look peculiar. And you know, if you meet a woman that's like, well, I don't want to be pretty, she's lying. <laughs> that's just all there is to it. She is lying. Because every woman wants that pretty moment, and that's what you put in the pages of Vogue magazine when you editorialize, even when it's a little out of bounds and over the top and on the edge, and I love on the edge as well, but there's a prettiness to it. Even if it's stretching our imagination and our ideas of what conventional beauty is, there's still prettiness to it, and, and that's what I always look for. Let's talk for a minute just about fashion exhibitions and the importance of them, especially when you're a student. We have um, three wonderful ones in Australia and more at the moment, um, with Jean-Paul Gaultier and another one that's been um, curated by Pamela Goldman, who I Pamela's amazing. 
Uh, what, what do you think? I mean, would you encourage students to go along to these exhibitions? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> Museums, galleries, movies, you know, in the world we live in today, everything is inspiring everything. It's, oh, is fashion inspired by the street? The street's inspired by fashion, fashion's inspired by the street, the food we're eating, the music we're listening to, the movies that we see, what's in museums. You know, there's a Teresa Moten exhibit right now at the uh, Musée Decoratif in Paris. Which Pamela which, did. Which Pamela did, which is probably the most superlative fashion exhibit I've ever seen. All of this pattern and print and bohemian gypsy peasant moment that's happening right now is because of the Therese Van Noten exhibit and because Fleetwood Mac is going on tour and Christine McVeigh is coming back and we all love Stevie Nicks. <laughs> you know, if you don't know who Stevie Nicks is, you need to Google her too and start listening to her because spring is all about Stevie Nicks. And, and I knew that was going to happen and then we started going to shows and we were hearing Stevie Nicks music in the shows so and like, all about Stevie Nicks right now. But you can't not be open to everything that is around you. You cannot design in a vacuum. You cannot design thinking that inspiration is only coming from one place. It's great that you love Rihanna, and I'm sure you all do, because everyone that's within your generation is like, oh my god, Rihanna! I love Rihanna too. But when she came to CFTA, Awards and everyone's freaking out about her with her like fur bow and her Swarovski covered nude bodysuit. It's a little Bob Mackie to me. And, and, and you know, and I love Bob Mackie. And you need to know who Bob Mackie is so you know what was actually the inspiration for what she was wearing. In fact, the first fashion show that I did when I joined Neiman Marcus in Beverly Hills was with Bob Mackie. And that's how old I am, and that's how long I've been doing this. Uh, I was doing shows with Johnny Versace when we actually had Naomi Campbell and Linda Evangelista opening the show in our Los Angeles store. We had Carl Lagerfeld doing personal appearances and actually Naomi Campbell opened that show as well. Can I tell a little story? Yeah, please do. <laughs> Carl was not designing Chanel at the time, he was still designing his own collection. And he created 18th century inspired costumes for our store windows. And it was the wigs, the jewelry, the shoes, the everything. He was also obsessed with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So the men's, no, I'm not kidding. So the men's waistcoats and breeches that were shredded denim were all for Anthony Cadiz because he knew that one of our sales girls was actually dating him. So all the men's pieces were Red Hot Chili Pepper costumes and in his imagination. And he had just illustrated the Emperor's new clothes, the fairy tale, so they had that very much Emperor's new clothes sensibility. So we did this enormous fashion show, we cleared off the entire fine apparel floor, we recreated the, the set from Paris, and Naomi came in and opened the show. And we were taking him from the lower level basement where everybody was gathering and then coming upstairs, and Carl had his fan, as he doesn't have so much anymore, but he had his fan at the time. And Naomi said, Carl, Carl, have I told you? I'm writing an article for Harper's Bazaar. My darling, I had no idea you even knew how to write. <laughs> Those are the moments that are worth everything. <laughs> I'm not even sure if you meant it as a dig, but it was just so good. It has stuck with me my entire life. So um, it's probably why she gets mad and throws things. <laughs> I've had the great pleasure of working with many, many fashion designers, and I, I feel very privileged about that. So, talking quickly just about store installations, and what probably a lot of people don't realise here, because we're all online shoppers at Neiman Marcus, I had the joy of visiting the Dallas store, sort of HQ, and you've literally, I mean, they've got a tradition, they've all had a tradition, of turning it over into an entire country, didn't you? We, we, were, we, we were known for what we called Fortnites, and they were actually the, the idea of Stanley Marcus, the, the son of the founder, and first began as a way to bring countries to the people of Dallas. Because Dallas is a very sophisticated urban city today, but in the day, people didn't travel transatlantically like they do now. So Stanley believed that if we can't get the people to the culture, we'll bring the culture to the people. And one of the first fortnights was actually a Paris fortnight, or not a Paris fortnight, a French fortnight, and they celebrated Paris on the fine couturiers in Paris and the artisans and the fashion. And it's actually what Karl Lagerfeld's 
Dallas Paris collection of style after this just last season because, and it's an interesting moment, because Chanel had just come back into the fashion world and Europeans were not wildly keen on the idea of Mademoiselle returning to fashion. She had quite a storied past, she was supposedly fraternizing with the enemy, and you know, I'm not going to get into all of that, but you can read about it somewhere else. Stanley believed that Americans were ready for Chanel back into the industry. So to launch this French fortnight, he brought Coco Chanel to Dallas. And they had a huge barbecue on his brother's ranch. For entertainment, they had a fashion show where they decorated bovine cows <laughs> in paper costumes of Mademoiselle's most recent couture collection. <laughs> How much do you love that? Can you imagine Chanel sitting there with a cigarette hanging out of her mouth watching cows walk <laughs> out with straw boaters? I'm sure she was wildly amused. As wildly amused as she was by the barbecue because she didn't like the taste of the spicy beef and the beans and she threw it under the table where all the dogs came lapping it up and it landed on the red satin shoes of Elizabeth Arden, which is in Stanley's book and I can't make this all up because it's the truth. So, um, from the French fortnight, we celebrated Italy, we celebrated Australia. We got to a point where we ran out of countries and we made a couple countries up because <laughs> Stanley believed he was here to refute me. So um, we, we loved the idea of it. And then later, we actually brought the Fortnites back and we celebrated Texas because if you live in Texas, you believe it's its own state. It always has. And in fact, when I had moved to Dallas from Los Angeles working for Neiman Marcus, Planes, trains, and automobiles, they put me with elbow length blonde hair running around in Gucci, going through the grasslands and the oil fields and the, the prairies of Texas to find the heart and soul of this great state. I was actually chased off of an oil field by a man with a rifle. <laughs> Son, what are you doing? I was like, I am the hell out of here. Uh, blonde hair blowing in the breeze. But we, we, have, we, have, we continue to create these events to exceed customers' expectations. The idea of them is actually, we would do them before the holiday season, we would do them after the height of fall selling, and it was to reinvigorate the customer's idea of shopping before the holiday season would hit. And then we actually would lay Christmas decorations on top of these country events. And it's an interesting idea, because it takes me to the modern day world today. When you think about how we're all Instagramming and, and photoing and, and sending out images and everyone's following fashion shows that are being live streamed, the customer is excited in the moment, but we as retailers have to figure out how to reignite and re-excite her about something that's going to be in a store six months later. We actually give too much information in the fashion industry because when it shows up in the store, you want to make sure she's not suffering from fatigue of seeing it six months before it on every celebrity as soon as it walks the catwalk. So in many ways, we're always looking for marketing ideas to get the customer re-excited about the season we're living in and remind her that what she's seeing being live streamed or on Instagram isn't available to her for another six months. Last night, we were treated to a lovely show and I felt that you did that so beautifully, that you captured the essence of the season you've just seen with actually the clothes of the season prior. Uh, how, how do you do that? Or maybe you can take us through, what are, what are you feeling from the collections we've just seen? Well, <clears throat> my mind works in its most um, unusual way many times. I, I mean, one, the library of fashion imagery in my head is magnanimous. And, and especially all of you as students, I, I hope you pay attention in art history. I hope you pay attention to the history of fashion. You have to know about architecture. You need to know about religious movements. You need to know about all of that. Because making clothes isn't just looking on style.com and going, oh my god, I love Celine. We all love Celine, but we don't need another Phoebe Philo. And it's not that you need to be so out of the weeds of ideas, but you need to have your own voice. And you find your own voice when you're inspired by art and, and ideas from the past, but reinventing it in your own vocabulary. And I have many images in my head, and I like to totally submerse myself in the moment. And it's truly this big 70s bohemian gypsy 
moment of kind of a, a peasantry that's going on, and, and it's very much a romanticized, exotic escapism that's taking place. And, and I've talked about this with all of you, I will talk to all of you about it as students. The news of the day is just grisly. You turn on your iPhone, it's just, ugh. you turn on the news, you open up the newspaper. The world feels like it's just the saddest place. And fashion has realized it is our role to transport, to transform, and deliver dreams like Busby Berkeley did during the Depression and, and take people to a more beautiful, happier place. Because we can't change what we're seeing in the news, but you have to lift people's spirits, even if it's ever so slightly. And that's why I love this kind of flower child dream that we saw in so many of the runways and the fluidity and all the beautiful embellishments and exoticism that really define the season. And when I go to the clothes, I don't look at labels. I look at the idea of a look. And if it feels like it's going to be beautiful together, I put it together. I don't care how much it costs. I don't care who the designer is. If it's beautiful in my eye, that's how I put it together. Which is what's so impressive as well, is you actually style those I do. still. You travel around the world and style it. <laughs> well, because I, when I'm not doing all the things I'm doing, I actually host customer events in our stores where I do fashion shows of 24, 36 looks. And it's kind of like the old Lucy and Ethel. I'm actually commentating. Because when customers go to big fashion shows and they're watching clothes trot by, they really have no idea what they're looking at or why they're seeing it. Women, men need direction. They don't need to be told what to do, but they want to know what's going on. They want to know why that shoe with that pant length, why that shoe with a maxi skirt and not with a mini skirt, why that silhouette of a coat over that shape of a dress. Because they're starved for information, they're curious about fashion, but they want to be informed. And just watching a fashion show, sometimes the ideas are so obscure. I mean, I usually think I'm getting it right, and then you find out, Tyrolean? Whatever. So, I mean, even I miss it sometimes, but I like to share with customers how it goes together and why. And then I spend the rest of the afternoon with the women in their bras and panties, and I'm dressing them and, and putting it together with them to help guide them in how to do it. So I can't talk about things that I haven't styled myself and that I don't 100% love. If somebody else did it for me and it walked out and looked hideous, I would just, I would plot right there on the runway. It's just like, I, I have to love it or I can't sell it. And that's why I style it myself. And it also keeps my design chops up. You know, if, if, if I'm not kind of intrinsically touching and feeling and, and manipulating, I, I'm not attached to it. And I, I like to be very attached to it. And that's why, I mean, there, there aren't many cans who are taking, who are seeing it from the runway right through the food chain, literally onto the woman's back. I love when so it gets on her back, it gets in a bag, and it goes to her closet, and it never returns again. And from there, I hope it goes to her daughter and her daughter, and it just becomes part of the heritage and the legacy of her curated closet. Not that I'm not happy to return things, but I want her to buy it and love it and really make her feel good when she wears it. When a woman opens her closet, she's like, oh my god, why did I buy that? I don't want her to ever feel that way. Now, I'd love to give um, everyone, because we're running out of time now, an opportunity to ask questions. Please, do you want to pass around the microphone? Thank you for coming, and thank you for everything you said. There's just something which has been... Um, you might get to give him that. Yeah, I can start. <clears throat> I'm sure you're speaking up, but my ears are so blasted off from living on an airplane. All my ears are rushing air most of the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, lately, they've been afraid that trends are fine, Doing it for the money is wrong, but I guess it's fine. Um, there's just the thing, some people really exist just to produce trend work, they are trend, trend wear um, and dress again and all that. But there are people that just, um, not only each other, but there are people that really care about what to cheer and one way. So when they hear that it's only 20% really, such as me, I get really happy and excited even more than I am because I'm going to make it 100. I'm not going to go into something that people are trying to make 100. When I see what material worth a hundred. So why does it I know there's a lot of people in this population these days and everyone wants to dress and money is bad. 
But why is it that people that are born whole hearted just from the Qatir are hearing that it's only 20 percent? I know it's going to excite me, so it's an advantage in my eyes. But why is it down to 20 percent? I mean, uh, people well, like Rishan right. Lakhmo. Yeah. I, I, actually, I have an answer for you, and I will tell you why it's, it's barely 20% of a buy for a runway. One, the selling time is so much longer for the pre-collections. Pre-fall arrives in stores July 15th-ish and does not get marked down until December. So the ability to get solid sell-throughs with high margins are greater because those clothes sit on the selling floor for a longer period of time. As much as we hope and pray that the superlative runway pieces deliver at an early enough date so we can get selling time for them, they're often so intricate because of embroidery and beads, they come so late in the season, you're lucky if you have two or three weeks of selling for them until they get marked down. So, so what it comes down to is things that ship early sell first. And things that are on the selling floor for a longer period of time have a higher gross margin and they have a stronger sell through. So it's not that we wouldn't buy more runway, but it gets there so late that if we put all of our money into these runway purchases, we would be bankrupt. And that's why a lot of the times we're thinking about a customer too. Oh, Mrs. So-and-so in Boston is going to love this. So-and-so in Los Angeles is going to love that. Because it's a hard risk because of those really superlative, expensive pieces. Two or three weeks and you don't sell them and it erodes your profitability. And that goes back to understanding a, a business model that makes sense. Because the more clothes I sell at regular price, the more I come back and spend more money on your collection and my buy with you gets bigger and bigger and bigger because I have solid selling. That make, does that make sense? I know, trust me, it destroys me as much as it destroys you as a creator that those runway things don't get made, but it's just a strange thing. I mean, you know, I'm sure you're up against it as well editorially. Yes? Kind of building on that, um, as young designers with obviously limited budgets, there's the pre-collection that sells, and then there's the runway collection that builds branding. As a young designer with limited, with limited funding, what do you think is more important to invest in, and when do you sort of move into the other side? I will tell you what my recommendation for you would be, is one, you could actually do a big collection that you produce early, and have part of that collection become your pre-collection that ships to stores with the rest of the pre-collection deliveries, and then save a portion of it that you present to create your brand. The other piece of it is, you don't have to spend a fortune on runway shows for all these images that you think that the world is waiting to see. You are smarter to build a solid business model with clothes that buyers are actually coming in, giving you a check, creating a brand, and then a season or two or a year or two later, then go do a runway and make your big splash. Because when you have all the money of these buyers coming in and supporting your brand, it will help you afford all of the bells and whistles that you want to build the brand. And you can build a brand slowly, organically, without immediately doing a fashion show. As you know, fashion shows are super expensive. And the, the other thing about pre-collections, to be very clear, <coughs> I mean, if you're a contemporary collection, you're doing a delivery a month. If you're a designer brand, you're delivering early in the season, but you also have to have a pre-collection, not only for the profitability, you cannot be out of the customer's mind's eye for that length of time. Because she has so many more options, she forgets about you. And then those clothes show up for a few weeks and it's like, oh yeah, this designer, what are they doing in the middle of the floor? You can't afford to not have your name, your label, and your goods in front of the customer when there are all those other clothes that are sitting on the floor as well. Yes? Just to be on that as well, um, Australian, like, because we're in Australia, we know our Australian brands better than uh, people overseas, and um, we don't often have the same recognition on the global market because we are so isolated. Um, as young designers, would we be better to um, say we love our stock lists, for example, in Australia, and then show our, say, our coming out show? Overseas, instead of just 
as gorgeous as this city is, you have to get out of the fact that you are so far away from the market. You have to get into New York, or you need to get into London, or into Paris, as Edwina was talking about, and possibly doing a collective of many designers that are showing so that you can get recognition, and so you can get notoriety, and then once you start getting buyers that are picking you up, then it's your responsibility to make sure you're delivering on time, and that the quality of what you're showing is there so that buyers and retailers have great faith in you. I mean, it would be terrific if, you, if we could believe that people would fly here to buy collections. It's expensive to fly here, and it takes forever to get here. <laughs> I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, but 17 hours later, I could like conceive and have children. I mean, it's like, so you, you truly, sometimes you have to bring it to your audience. Doesn't mean that you can't design here, doesn't mean that you can't use the, the great inspiration of how gorgeous the world is around you, but you need to bring your goods to the people. Yes? Uh, how important is it that you have a press agent or someone else that is, I suppose, profiling your brand on a more global scale? You know, would you buy a designer that has never hit any single piece of press in, on any global level? We actually do. What we need to know is that you can, once an order is placed, you can supply it. And that when we come back the next season, you're going to be there again so we can start to build a business. You know, truly, the biggest hindrance for a retailer of my size is if you don't have a pre-collection. And, and, and that, that really becomes one of the biggest deciding factors. A little, a little rail of 12 pieces is not how you can do business with a big retailer. It's great for a boutique because they can babysit that collection and sell it. But I need more than 12 pieces on a rail, and I need a great collection. And if you're a contemporary brand, and I will tell you, in the American market, the money's all being made in the contemporary brands now. Alice and Olivia, and Rag and Bone, and Helmut Lang, and those brands are hot, but those are 10 to 12 deliveries a season. Because that customer, her appetite is insatiable. She cannot get enough clothes. God, I love her. I mean, she can't get enough clothes. And I'll tell you an interesting little um, secret, and I would imagine it's probably something you experience here as well. We have a lot of mother-daughter shopping at Neiman Marcus. And they love shopping in the contemporary departments because the mother loves to be with the daughter because she gets the lens of her young daughter's idea of how clothes go together. And guess what the daughter gets? The love of the buying power of mom's credit card. So it's a win-win. Mom has her personal stylist. The daughter has her financier. So like everybody's happy. So it's, it's interesting because that's where we see a lot of growth in the American market right now is what we call the contemporary world. It takes, and I should have said this sooner, but I'm, I'm probably talking too much. And this is something that, that I have always understood. It's something that Anna Wintour and I talk about all the time, and you agree. It takes 10 years for a brand to achieve the success and generally financial success that you're looking for. Editorial acclaim can come overnight for a designer, but it doesn't pay the bills. It can be a 10-year process for you to get to where you want to go. So you have to have the want and the drive to hang on for 10 years because it can take that long for a brand to really set. Alexander Wang is a little bit of a misnomer in that because he saw immediate success much sooner, but it can take up to 10 years, yes? I think what's most important is that you have two, four seasons a year and that the quality of what you're doing is what we're looking for and that silhouettes are flattering, that you like color. Now don't get me wrong, I sell black 
but I never talk about black. You do not have to tell a woman how to buy a black dress. Black is like part of the commercial collection. It has to have the earmark of femininity. It has to celebrate a woman and her curves. This sounds so silly, but do you know how many times I go to young designer collections and I swear that you have no idea that women have a bosom? I mean, it's like, where is she putting all that happiness upstairs? <laughs> and, but you know, you all laugh, but you know how often I see clothes that do not accommodate a woman's curves. And American women, and Russian women, and South American women, and Australian women, they have curves. So think about who the woman is. If it's a $3,000 dress, a woman who can spend $3,000 on a dress probably is not 27 years old. And if she is, we love her all the more. But we're looking for clothes that celebrate a woman's shape, celebrate femininity. We love color, we love ornamentation. Because that's what our customers are looking for. What about some of the It's interesting that you bring up lookbooks. Many times I get lookbooks from young designers and you are doing yourself the greatest disservice when you try to be so all courant because you turn us off, make the models attractive, shoot those clothes straight on, let Edwina and her team hang them upside down from the limbs on the side of a beach somewhere, make the clothes look as great as the clothes can look. Because when a lookbook is appealing, it actually will get you an appointment. It will actually get you an appointment. And many times include your price list. People send me pictures, it's like, well, what price band? Oh, we're like Chloe. Okay, um, well, <clears throat> include your price list. But are you ashamed of what you're charging? Just tell me the truth. Give me the information so I have it in my hand because I bring lookbooks to my to my team, to my buyers, to my divisionals. We go over, this is great looking. Oh, look at the price of that. Really a good price for a dress that looks like that. All of that information we actually glean and go through. But make it an attractive lookbook. She doesn't need to look like Vampyra crawling out of the mud. I mean, that might be your vision of a woman, but no woman wants to look like that. I don't know if that's really your vision. I'm sure it's not. You look like a perfectly adorable young man. But, you know, make the clothes appealing and don't make it an art project when you're doing a lookbook. Yes. Um, how do you see the markets as different to buyers or, um, or sex? And how would you, you know, um, search for contemporary buyers different to you know, from what, what separates all of it is our direction and how our buyers curate a collection. You know, um, one, Saks Fifth Avenue does not have me. Um, <laughs> Clothes look different in every store. And you want to be in Saks Fifth Avenue. You want to be in Barnes. You know, generally, I would, and, and I don't like to speak generally, we really do like clothes that have a little bit more of a femininity. Uh, we really do, our customer is feminine. She, she's not looking to be the edgiest woman in the room. And I have edgy customers, but she, she wants to have a femininity to her. Um, I, I do believe that because the role of a fashion director is something that not every every department store has. We are able to call down the ideas of the season and we send our buyers in that direction. That's what my job is. You know, if there's not a collective mass of ideas in the market, then it's not an important trend. Because when you market, when you advertise, when I'm out talking about clothes, if I'm talking about some obscure thing that one designer did and the customer comes into a store online looking for it, she's furious with me because it's not available to her. And so there needs to be kind of this collective idea of where fashion's going, so when she walks into the store, and we really try to make sure that we curate the collections from contemporary, sportswear, all the way to the highest level of our brands, that what we believe in is represented. And I think that really does make Neiman Marcus very different, as well as we have superlative selling associates, and we also try to make sure that the shopping experience online is as superlative as it is in store. And, and, and we're authoritative. You all follow fashion magazines. I know you don't do this. When you pick up a magazine and it says, 176 trends you need now, 
my God, it's paralyzing to a woman. I mean, she doesn't need 176 things now, and we are not about 176 things at Neiman Marcus. We really kind of call it down to understandable chic ideas that make sense to a woman. We don't dumb it down, but we call down the ideas of trend so our voice is clear, and so I'm cutting through bloggers and everyone who's out there in the world, and I think that our curatorial ability to look at each collection is really what separates us from other retailers. Yes. This has been the most amazing session. So many ideas. Oh, thank you. It's been great. Um, I'm just going to focus in on a couple of things that you've talked about that are just pertinent, clear, and interesting. So it's easy to dress a 19 year old woman. Um, me, me and Marcus loves a woman's curves. Um, women have breasts. So there's all of those issues that I think, in terms of fashion, Critical. They're critical right now in terms of looking at a future market. So, if the market is going to age for the next you know, 20 years of life, suddenly like we're all alive until 100. My question then is um, Does fashion die out at a particular age? I mean, I'm not bored with it. Oh, God. Oh, no. I can't find no, it. No, no, it never it's dies so out. Fast. <laughs> That's what I think. I think it's a human thing that. It is something that's always with us. We always want to look good. And I've recently dressed my 85-year-old mother suffering from dementia in this fine that I've located in Ralph Lauren, you know, very lightweight black suit. Right in hunchback, osteo, she looked amazing. And how and fantastic did she feel while she was wearing she it? She did. We got the lipsticks out and you know, it was really good. But those options just aren't there. And I think for me, that's what I want to explore. It's part of um, I guess my age, but it's also, as a business model, I do a lot of work in strategy, how the hell can you avoid not pleasing someone on my income? Well, it, it's, it's an interesting idea because I will tell you what, what I find, everyone is 25. It doesn't matter if you're 17 or 77 or 107, we all want to believe we're 25. And it doesn't mean that everything has to have a cutout or a midriff, but we want clothes to have an effervescence to them. And I think that's what's so interesting because even young girls want to look a little bit older than they are. If you're mature, you don't want clothes to like rocking chair granny. I mean, my mother's like in, you know, 76, and she does not look like a 76-year-old woman. She loves clothes. What changes is a woman's lifestyle. And I think that's what's so important that we all have to think about. More than an aging market, how does a customer's lifestyle change? When you look at brands like Brunello Cuccinelli, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, with luxury cashmere and, and, you know, these amazing, comfy, cozy clothes, a woman's lifestyle in general is getting a little bit more casual. Now, we're very much an event-driven store. She needs her luncheon clothes, she needs her gala clothes, but she also needs everyday clothes, but she doesn't want to look like a slob. So it becomes lifestyle and being keen to how people are living their lives today. It's like why sneakers and trainers and tennis shoes and skaters are so popular. So you have to think about, who is my customer? It's where we kind of started the conversation. Who is she, and how is she dressing, and where is life taking her? So this follow-up for me is, is she and he reduced to sneakers and trainers? And but they're well, chic well, sneakers and trainers, right? As opposed to, we're, we're not talking about you know going into the gymnasium and pulling them out of a gym. It's it's the idea of even doing a velvet sneaker or a velvet trainer, and that doesn't have to be your aesthetic. But it's important that you think about the lifestyle of how a woman's living today because it's changing. You know, it used to change every several years. It can change in a nanosecond as quickly as things are moving right now. So I guess this is leading to the room if my 85 year old mother fits into the beautiful, beautifully made rubber and suit now because she's 85. Um, but she wouldn't have said she was. Twenty-three, because she was born with 
I think I think to, to, to say to I think I think globally mm. there are plenty of options. Mm. Now are all Australian designers offering those options? No. Are we sometimes a little bit youth obsessed within our Australian design community? If you look at the ones who get most of the media attention, yes. But there are wonderful Australian designers who don't get nearly as much media attention because they're not the hot new thing and that's the nature of fashion. Everybody's always talking about the hot new thing who are, are providing great options. It's so. fascinating to say that everyone wants to be 25 and that's great. Hello. Um, Thank you, by the way, everything you've said has been really insightful. I was um, really curious to see what you had to say about wearable technology. Um, wearable technology. And, um, and then the second part of that question would be, so what are you doing to keep up in the digital world? A wearable technology. Uh, uh, well, you know, it's, it's interesting because what moves fashion forward is technology. And fabrications, the modernity of print and pattern making. We're always looking at technology within our organization. We now have mirrors that you can go into a dressing room and you can create a picture of yourself and the look and change. We have new technology we're just launching right now where if I see that sneaker, I can take a picture of it. It's gonna tell me whose sneaker it is and where I can buy it. Technology is changing everything in our industry. We have two arms, two legs, a torso. I mean, the body changes a little bit over time, but it's technology that's moving fashion forward. And so if it's, if it's fabric technology and textile technology, or if it's actually technological advancement. I mean, the other thing that's very dis different, you're asking what makes Neiman Marcus different just as a store. All of my selling associates have iPhones. So they are continually communicating through texting, emailing, photographing a look, sending it to a customer, letting them know it's available. We, we are very tech savvy because nobody picks up the phone anymore. So we're using technology as innovation to propel ourselves forward in, in this modern world. So we're appealing to your generation and into the generation beyond. So it's very important. It's a very important piece of it. And being on Instagram and Facebook and social media so we all know what each other's doing and know what we're eating and where we're heading. <laughs> well, you know, right now we're, we're opening a, a new store in upstate New York and then also in Manhattan. It's our first store ever in New York City because our sister store, Bergdorf Goodman, has, um, has always been there. We, we are, there's no conversation currently of brick and mortar in, in foreign cities, but I never say never. Because it was just three years ago we started shipping internationally. I'm sure if you all read in Women's Wear Daily, we've just acquired by Teresa. Um, so we actually, which is part of the Neiman Marcus group now, so we have that online business as well as the My Teresa shop in Munich. So we're always looking for international opportunities. We, we understood very early, we were the first luxury retailer to go online 15 years ago when nobody was shopping online. We had this conversation around the table. Well, women pay $600 for a pair of Manolo Blahnik shoes. That lets you know it was 15 years ago, because I don't even think there are shoes for $600 for Manolo Blahnik anymore, and she did. She, she bought two pairs, because she wasn't sure which size she was, and when I say she, I mean the great she of them all, and when she figured out her size, she just kept shopping. I sell $8,000 dresses from Alexander McQueen and $15,000 Oscar de la Renta ball gowns, on the internet. So the ability to move forward in the future is all about technology. And we are always updating our technology because we believe it's the future of our fashion scholars. We're just going to take one more, sorry. Yeah. Um, so you've been working with Neiman Marcus for a long You better not change a thing. No, no. <laughs> Everything needs to move forward. I, but it's a good question, because I think you all need to understand, you become known for core items. If you're a jacket resource, if you're a pant resource, if you make a great dress, you can't be flip-flopping sizes, fit, all of that. What really builds a strong brand and a customer loyalty is that you understand what your real core 
strengths are, and you play to those. You know, it doesn't mean that you don't tweak and rearrange and, 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 and reinvent, but you can't be changing drastically every season your fit and your ideas and the woman you're attracting, because when she shows up next season to buy your clothes, you've totally turned her off. Does, does that answer kind of, and, and, it, and I'm not saying, don't give me the same thing over and over and over. I, I will tell you ultimately what I look for in a collection. I'm looking for something a woman does not already have in her closet. Because my customer is obsessive with clothes. So if she bought culottes for spring, I might get another good season of culottes out of a whole other range of women for fall, but then I'm pretty much done with it. Because she has culottes and she doesn't need any more of them. I'm looking for something she doesn't have in her closet and my customer has everything. And you have to think about that. What does she not have? What did I talk to her about last season? What can I bring newness to for her this season? Thank you. Thank you. You have been extraordinary. Please join me in the <laughs>